All right, welcome to October 2022's Abdominal Trauma. We're going to be doing our monthly continuing education on abdominal trauma. We did thoracic trauma last time, so I hope everyone enjoys this. Just like before, it looks pretty much similar to what we saw with thoracic trauma. We're going to define the different types of abdominal trauma in the pre-hospital setting and then talk about closed versus open abdominal trauma as well as go through some scenarios to help us solidify what we already know. We're going to shake it up a little bit. We're going to go directly into a scenario. You have John Doe, age 43, involved in a three-vehicle motor vehicle incident. It's a rainy day outside. The patient's in the vehicle that was struck on the driver, passenger, and the front side. Everyone is ambulatory at this time. As you roll up on scene, this is what you see. You see three vehicles, two with pretty major slash catastrophic damage, and then you have a minor moderate damage right here. The vehicle right here has a B-post damage with a wheel that looks like it's coming off, so possibly moderate to major. And then you have catastrophic damage. These vehicles are not driving anywhere. The engine looks like it's been removed from this vehicle. Also, when you look at this vehicle right here, you see that you have crumple zones in the back, as well as shattering of the windshield, a lot of things inside of this cab that could cause secondary impact. And then over here, you also shattering the windshield. So you don't know if the shattering is from the crumple or from someone's head. We don't know if someone's worn their seatbelt. You see one airbag that's deployed. I don't know if it's been deployed here, and I don't see any airbag being deployed over here. So again, you have a lot of potential for injury. So even if these patients say, oh, I don't need EMS, they should still be a patient refusal based on the mechanism of injury to protect yourself in the department from any type of litigation. So let's talk about your primary survey. Remember, PHCLS is X, A, B, C, D, E. And these patients that you're going to need to evaluate Obviously, if they're walking wounded, they're green tag. If they're serious, they're red. If it's in the middle, you know, mm, they, they can walk. There's some injuries, whatever, maybe yellow. But more importantly, we need to talk about what we're going to see when we think about the X, A, B, C, D, E. So we start with exsanguination. We have obvious bleeding from his head, and there's blood on the bilateral pant legs. He's able to talk, state his name. He has quiet bilateral breast sounds, one plus radial pulse, weak and thready, has no C-spine tenderness, but complains of chest pain and bilateral hip, back and leg pain, and he has large ecchymosis on the left hip and the abdomen whenever you look. Now, we got to take the clothes off. This is a serious injury now. He's got multiple complaints with a, um, with a high velocity MOI. And this is what you see right here. You see this diffuse ecchymosis along the left hip the left uh, groin area here, and the left thigh. So definitely room where he could have been hit from the side, the seatbelt sign possibly, lots of things going on here. So what's our primary field diagnosis? Well, motor vehicle incident with possibility of internal damage. Does this necessarily need to be a level one? Well, I don't think so. I mean, we haven't even gotten vital signs yet. So if I told you his vital signs were stable, then you could swing it and say, we don't need to go to a level one. Now we're gonna talk about level one activation and level two activations and trauma activations and period at the end of this presentation again. But remember, it, it needs to be altered mental status. It needs to have low blood pressure. It does not necessarily need to be just by mechanism of injury. So we'll, we'll evaluate that a little bit later. So what tests or procedures do you need to do? Obviously a great physical exam, you need to make that patient naked. You need to evaluate that patient's bilateral lower extremities. The patient has back, bilateral thigh, bilateral leg pain. He may have a fracture or a cold fracture and you don't know about it. So you need to visualize the patient. And also, if this patient's having back pain, you need to run your, your hands down the spine to make sure that this patient doesn't have any step offs or deformities. If the patient does have continued lumbar or thoracic back pain, they need to be laying flat on the stretcher unless they have a head injury and then we start to worry about increased intracranial pressure and that's again one of those conundrums that you're going to have to deal with whenever you're talking about the need for complete spinal immobilization versus the need to protect the brain. Finally, what's the determination for disposition? We've talked about a little bit about what we need to do and if this patient based on our primary and secondary evaluation meets criteria to go to a level one trauma center, absolutely take them there. If not, they can go to a non-tier trauma center. Moving on to the forms of abdominal trauma, again, just like thoracic trauma, we have penetrating and blunt, penetrating and stab wounds, impalements, gunshots. It also may cause pneumothorax, a diaphragmatic rupture with enough force it can blow the diaphragm out. 
And so therefore you have to be aware that if the patient's saying, oh, I can't breathe and you're hearing gut sounds in the, in the lungs, lung area, you may have a perforated diaphragm with viscera inside of the thoracic cavity. Now blunt on the other hand is when you have mechanisms with increased endothoracic pressure, motor vehicle incidents are the most common cause of abdominal trauma as well as falls. And so our MVCs, we see a lot of them, but they have the potential for a lot of damage. We just have to be our, our radar open and ready to view these problems as they come along. So let's review some of the anatomy here. We got a lot of things going on, a lot of real estate in the stomach. And then right above the liver in the stomach, we have the lungs and the heart. And so this small sheet of muscle called the diaphragm protects it. And just because you may have an abdominal trauma doesn't mean it can't translate up and it can't translate down. Because remember, we have the big vessels that come down behind. We have the bladder right here. We got a lot of stuff. So the anatomical regions are the posterior thor abdominal area, then we have the back, and then we have the anterior abdomen, the anterior thoracic abdominal area, and then the anterior axillary line and the posterior axillary line. And remember, for those of you who remember when we were talking about our needle decompression, this is where we have the anterior mid axillary line, which is where we would do our chest needle dart now. And then finally, we have the flank, which is going to proceed up to this area right here, the flank that we traditionally refer to for our pyelonephritis and our kidney stone area. So don't forget about that flank area. But as we can see in here, we got a lot of area. We have liver, we have spleen, pancreas, gallbladder, if they have one, you have the large intestine, the small intestine, you have the um, bladder, you have the great vessels, you have the minor vessels, the tributaries that come off, lots of areas for damage. When assessing a patient with closed abdominal trauma, make sure you note how you found the patient and the presence of the pain that increases with movement, palpation, or specific any type of movement or activities that they do, because that can help lead you to where it's going on. It can help you differentiate between a ruptured kidney versus a ruptured spleen. It can help you determine if you're going to have an acute abdomen. It's very important that you see how they were found and what you did and how that affected them. In addition, when you do your physical exam with these severe traumas and you do make them naked, any blood from the mouth, rectum, penis, or the vagina is very important to note. Now, I'm not telling you to go in, look around, but what I am telling you is, is that if you notice that there's blood on the tip of the penis or there's blood on the vagina, obviously the follow-up question would be for the vagina is, are you on your menstrual cycle? If they say no, that is a clear indication that they possibly have bladder involvement. So any signs of unexplained shock should lead you to suspect serious abdominal or thoracic trauma and specifically retroperitoneal bleeding or bleeding behind the abdominal viscera that we're so used to seeing. And these may actually be missed on fast exams, which is our ultrasound in the ER. And instead, the only way that you find them is through CT. Closed abdominal trauma is mainly treated by managing the ABCs or the airway breathing circulation providing early treatment for any developing shock that you can see either by the patient's mentation as an early sign with the form of anxiety, or looking at the vital signs as they start to change throughout your transport, and making sure that we do a rapid transport to a trauma center from patient care time to departure should be less than 10 to 20 minutes. And that is our primary goal for Brex practices. Here are trauma core measures, and these are not necessarily the official core measures, but absolutely we must be less than 20 minutes on scene. We need to do a trauma activation in less than 10 minutes upon patient arrival in order to prepare the, this team for our arrival, making sure that we maintain airway breathing circulation and then doing your spinal motion restriction policy as necessary. If they have airway problems that we do an MPA or an tracheal tube, if necessary for a GCS less than eight, obviously if the patient has a clenched jaw, you can't do it, you're just gonna have to bag valve mask. Applying bandages and tourniquets as necessary for hemorrhage control, maintaining oxygen greater than 94% with 100% FiO2, 
and then we have our pelvic binder or traction splint as necessary for pelvic or long bone stabilization. Warm fluids is very important, although we don't have a warmer. It's important to reduce the triangle of death that comes with the trauma, and that's with our hypothermia. And then keeping our blood pressure greater than 90 millimeters of mercury. Maintaining a temperature with heat on in the unit, that's kind of hard for us to do, but we got to do it to make sure we reduce the hypothermia. And then elevating head of bed with head injury greater than 30 degrees and keeping the CO2 between 30 to 35 with end tidal CO2 for head injuries. Here's our trauma activation as promised. If you have a blood pressure less than 100 or less than 110 for a 65 year old, if you had to do a field intubation, unstable airway, GCS less than 12, pulses extremity tra traumatic paralysis, open pelvic fracture, those would be our level one activations. Our level two activations, which is the only difference is, is we don't have blood readily available, is a GCS less than 14 or um, loss of consciousness greater than five minutes. And then as we can read right here, these are all options. Now you'll notice that prolonged extrication, this is applicable to the motor vehicle incident here, or ejection from a motorcycle or being flung off of a horse or an ATV. Also ejection or rollovers. These are all incidences where we need to be highly aware that this most likely will need to have a trauma alert and be seen by a trauma surgeon. Let's do a multi-victim as our first multi-victim, Janet Smith and Joseph Smith, 58 and 32 multiple GSW victims at a known home of drug use, bystanders heard gunshots, and they called 911. So obviously we need to be worried about scene safety, we need to have law enforcement there, and then the law enforcement says you're cleared to go in. This is the house that you roll up to. We got a lot of Louis Vuitton, got some high quality material here on the roof, it just looks like a powder keg ready to blow up. So we wanna make sure that we also are aware that known drug use what kind of drugs meth were they cooking meth is this place going to explode whenever i enter or arrive who knows and so we need to make sure that we are consciously aware of the dangers the unique dangers that this scene may present in addition to that we may have multiple victims inside this house they've heard gunshots we you know obviously janet and joe i gave it to you but before you knew that you just knew there were gunshots and you have multiple victims so making sure that you have the resources available to provide the care to these patients so Janet and Joe, remember, PHC less, X, A, B, C, D, E, exsanguination, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. Here we go. Here is patient 2A. This is Janet. No obvious bleeding, but a knife is embedded in the right lower quadrant. She's mumbling. She has clear bilateral breast sounds. She has an absent radial pulse and one plus carotid. That's a bad sign, y'all. That means her blood pressure is low. She's probably bleeding out internally. She has no C-spine tenderness, but complains of abdominal pain and has a large ecchymosis on the abdomen with a knife that's clearly embedded in her abdomen. Going on to Joe. Joe has obvious bleeding at the left lower quadrant and left flank. He states his name, has clear bilateral breast sounds, has an absent radial pulse, he's one plus carotid pulse, no C-spine tenderness, but has back and abdominal pain. And when you expose him where he was complaining that he has large cavities on the flank and abdomen, let's look at what that looks like. Here's Janet and here's Joe. Looks like we got some bad things going on with Janet and Joe. So what are we going to do to manage this? Well, if you said that we're going to stabilize the knife, not pull it out, keep it there, manage shock, manage our ABCs, you're 100% right. Now over here, are we going to pack these wounds? No, absolutely not. We're not going to pack them. We're just going to put a bandage over it and try to control the hemorrhage as best we can. Can we use a tourniquet in any of these people? Absolutely not. There's nowhere to put it. So therefore, we have unique presentations of traumatic injuries that do quite have the possibility of suffering extreme morbidity and mortality within minutes to hours. What is the preliminary field diagnosis? Obviously with Janet, we have an embedded knife inside of the abdomen going over the anatomy that could possibly have been injured, the liver, the large intestine, the small intestine. We have vascular structures that are involved. We have the gallbladder, we have the pancreas, possibly even the stomach if it was down there. We have the duodenum. We have all the things that could be affected at that person's injury. Now, Joseph, on the other hand, he's got cavitary lesions on his left flank. He could have blown out his kidney, his ureter, his large, his small intestine. He could have blown out vascular structures, muscles. We could have blown out the bladder. We could have even went up all the way and blown out the, the liver, the gallbladder, the stomach, the any of those organs in that area that were there. Now, it was on the left, so predominantly, most likely, you're not going to have those right-sided effects. But remember, blood excuse me, bullets and projectile objects can travel 
anywhere in that space. And so therefore it can just create a whole surreptitious path and destroy everything in its wake. What test procedures do you need to do? Well, first off, we need to get a good set of bottle signs. We need to get that warm fluid if possible, fluid period. We need to make sure the patient is in a position of comfort, evaluating the body for any other injuries, getting that patient naked, because what may have been a cavitary lesion on the abdomen could have blown out on his chest or um, he could have fractures open, you know, multiple gunshots were heard, so we don't know. Again, you have to cut the clothes off of these patients. What's the determination of disposition? Absolutely, they have to go to a level one trauma center. Speaking specifically about open abdominal trauma, we have evisceration. Make sure that you remove all the clothing on these patients and roll the patient to make sure you found all of the injuries, including any wounds, entrance or exit. Control for bleeding, do not pack the abdomen. You can pack an extremity, but do not pack an abdomen or the thorax. Cover the wounds with sterile gauze or abdominal pads that should be irrigated with some sterile saline Drape gently over the wound with gentle pressure applied. Do not attempt to push the abdominal contents back into the body cavity. Unfortunately, this may risk further injury, infection, or damage that would cost, could possibly have been salvaged with the trained hand of a surgeon. And unfortunately, it also may be unlikely to succeed, thereby causing more discomfort to your patient. Impaled objects also should never be removed. That goes back to EMT class. The clothing should be cut away from around the object. The clothes should be removed from the patient to expose the patient to see if there's any other wounds. Keep the area irrigated with some normal saline or, or normal water and just dress with a bulky dressing to control the bleeding. Seal the wound from any further contamination and anchor the object in place. So you could use kind of a modified chest seal if you want to cut around it, put that around the wound to create any type of air from coming in and creating an air seal and then anchoring the object in place with however you can to curl X's rolled up, tape it together, and so on. That'll help to reduce the pain, reduce further injury, and help you along the way. Again, this slide should look familiar from August. The vital signs are very important for the diagnostics of trauma, heart rate, blood pressure, Glasgow coma scale, pulse ox, and tidal CO2 because of the lactate, and temperature, must get a temperature. The physical exam, cut off all the clothes in serious trauma, all of them, including the underwear, all of it comes off. You cannot do a physical exam without doing that. In addition to that, you you're, you are the first chain in the link of care, pre-hospital and then hospital and then post-hospital care. If you do not cut the clothes off, then we have to spend another minute or two cutting the clothes off in the trauma bay. You save us time and help the patient. It's about patient care and being that handoff. And then also, if they do have altered mental status, getting a blood glucose to make sure there isn't anything else going on. Again, here is a mock protocol for trauma assessment, making sure that we address vital signs every five minutes for any trauma activations and alerts, making sure that we recognize with the XABCDE approach to approach the trauma assessment in a careful, concerted way. Airway, if they don't have the ability to manage the airway, you stop and consider intubation. Breathing, if they don't have good breathing, then you may check the lungs. And the lungs, if they have absent breast sounds, then you need to do needle decompression. Exsanguination, what can you do for this? Well, consider a tourniquet, fluids, and stop the bleed. Circulation, same thing. Disability, make sure you check your BGL and assess your for altered mental status, getting your glass coma scale. And then exposure, removing the clothes and keeping them warm. Remember, transport to a hospital needs to be within an hour in order to make sure that the golden hour is met. Again, to go over the trauma activation versus a trauma alert, these would be considerations to go to a trauma center, i.e. Oshner LSU, making sure that the blood pressure is less than 100 any time, and it has to be real, so just because the life pack says 100, you probably need to do a manual, and then your SBP less than 110 for a 65-year-old, field intubation, unstable airway, your Glasgow coma cell was under 12, Penetrating trauma to the head, neck, torso, or above the elbows or knees, which we know about, pulses, extremity, traumatic paralysis, or open pelvic fracture. Now, a closed pelvic fracture, it still needs to come to the trauma center, and that would be unstable, and you can see that right here. Pediatrics, any signs of abnormal perfusion, any airway compromise, or a P or a U on the AVPU scale. Now, for the non-blood activation, but still a level one, any GCS less than 14, or loss of consciousness, um, greater than five minutes, open depressed skull fracture, unstable pelvic, crushed or mangled to gloved extremity, two or more long bone fractures, 
significant chest or pelvis injury, thermal inhalation, falls greater than 10 feet or three times their height, which we see with pedest or the pediatrics here. MVCs with ejection, rollover, significant damage. And now you see here, rollover with significant damage. That's a high mechanism of injury. Occupant death, high mechanism of injury, you still take them to the level one. Autopeds, ejection from motorcycle or ATV or animal, like a horse or a donkey or whatever. Lightning strikes, blaster explosions, electrical energies that are high energy, not just from the socket. Prolonged extrication greater than 20 minutes, okay? And pregnancy greater than 22 weeks. They still need to come to us, not St. Mary's. And then NBC with inadequate restraint or ignore car seat for a pediatric patient. So I hope you enjoyed this month's CE. If you have any questions, we're more than happy to answer them. Remember the takeaway points from the abdominal trauma lecture here is that you can have open or closed. We most likely see closed NBCs are the most likely portions of getting these closed abdominal injuries. They can hide injuries. There's a lot of room to bleed inside there. If they are demonstrating signs of decompensation, that might mean that we kind of already are behind the eight ball. That needs to be a very expeditious delivery to the emergency department, but that does not mean that we cannot do the quality care benchmarks of excellence, which means that we do our XABCDE before we get our vital signs. We do our blood pat. We make sure that we get our vital signs and making sure that if they're low, that we appropriately address them and that we communicate effectively. Remember, if you have a GCS less than 14, you need to talk about how you're taking the points off. Eyes, verbal, motor, making sure that you're not just saying, I have a GCS 12 and it's because they're paralyzed, but they're mentating well. You need to make sure you communicate what you took off for. All right, well, if you have any questions, I look forward to them. Thank you so much.